that was easy. All right, so we're gonna be proving a really awesome result called Ogden's Lemma, which is a nice generalization of the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So I, I've written it here. And the whole thing is here, but the parts that are in blue are what change from the usual pumping lemma for context-free languages. So what does it say? It says, we got to have a context-free language, all right? That's the same as the usual pumping lemma. Then there is this pumping constant P such that for any string in the language that's long enough, meaning that has at least P characters in it, so this is usual pumping lemma stuff, but now we're going to say that we have P symbols of W marked, and marked is not really a precise term. It just means that we're going to denote certain characters of W. And you can mark this in any way you wish, any marking that you wish uh, at all. Then there's a way to write that string W into those five parts. Again, usually like the pumping lemma. Uh, such that the three middle pieces have don't have too many marked things. Um, so uh, P is this particular number for L. So it's a fixed constant that depends on L, but the length of the string could be way longer than that. But the middle piece doesn't have too many of them. So here, too many uh, means at most P. Then if we extract the middle piece out, we just take the, the second and the fourth piece, so take the middle one out, it must have at least one mark thing. So this is like the usual pumping lemma where we have to have the lengths of the two pieces at least one. Whereas here, we say we are saying something stronger, which is saying that we have at least one marked symbol. Not We could have more things that are unmarked, but at least one marked thing. And then uh, additionally, we have that we can pump the second and the fourth piece. So, uh, so here that means u, v to the i, x, y to the i, z is an L for all i. Okay, so, so what does this actually pictorially look like? Well, if we consider a, uh, a derivation of this particular string w, or a parse tree, it, we, we will get something that looks like this. So we have some internal nodes, etc. So uh, eventually we're going to have some kind of structure that looks like this. So this is the string w here. And so we have the characters, let's say w1 up to wn so the length of the string is going to be at least p but it could be way longer as i mentioned okay so this says that we can write the string in five pieces so there's some piece u here let's use this side of the marker then v then uh, x uh, y and z so each of these are going to occupy some amount of space of the original string Again, uh, it doesn't say exactly how big each one of them is, although there are some bounds on that, but uh, each one of these pieces could be any particular length. I'm just drawing it in a, in a certain way. Then what this says is that we're gonna mark some symbols. So the VY piece must have, um, must have at least one marked thing, so let's put it in V here. Then uh, VXY, has uh, at most p things. So it can't have too many marked things. So let's say that many. And it could have way smaller, but here we have p symbols uh, that are marked. So actually, what I actually meant to say is that we have at least p symbols marked. But uh, we might as well assume for right now that we have p symbols marked. So we don't have too many in the vxy part, but we can have a whole bunch uh, in the u part and the z part over here. Okay. So why does this generalize the normal pumping lemma? Well, what you do in the normal pumping lemma to, to get, uh, get it from this is you just say every symbol's marked. <laughs> then if you have every symbol marked, then that means that we have at most uh, P characters for this part, which is the usual pumping lemma. This would have length at least one. And, and then now we have the original pumping lemma. So here, this just says at least P symbols marked. So if we mark everything, then we're all good. But if we choose not to mark certain things, then we're gonna get something stronger by using Ogden's lemma here. So let's go ahead and start proving this. So what do we actually need? Well, in order to get this structure to go, 
what we need is a context-free grammar. So you actually can prove this with, um, with a uh, context-free grammar in Chomsky normal form. Uh, sorry, without Chomsky normal form. So like in any arbitrary context-free grammar, but I'm gonna work with a grammar in Chomsky normal form because it'll actually make things a little easier. So, so let's prove this. So let's let uh, G be a context-free grammar in CNF, Chomsky normal form, for this particular language. And if you don't remember, Chomsky normal form just says that every uh, variable must go to a terminal or every variable must go to two non-start variables. Or we can have that the start variable goes to the empty string. And that's it. So B and C here are not the start variable. So the if you stare at this long enough, you'll see that um, if we pick um, any string, any W and L, um, such that it has a certain length, well, what is the length here? Well, what we will calculate is that the, the length of the string needs to be 2 to the k plus 1. Uh, so we're going to pick any string w such that uh, the length of w is equal to 2 to the k plus 1. I haven't, uh, I haven't said what k is in a sec, but I will. Actually, the plus 1's upstairs. Um, just to keep things safe, but it, I think you can actually make it a little smaller than this. So k here is the number of variables in the in the grammar g. Okay, and why the plus one? It's so that we will get some kind of repetition because there seems to be some kind of repetition here because we're repeating v and y here. So what we're gonna do is we have the string w down here. So this is W, just like the picture I just erased. Um, so then what we're going to do is we're going to mark the symbols of W in any way that we wish. So as long as we mark at least P of them. So I'm going to have some mark things here, not so many in the middle, probably, but it doesn't have to be in this particular way. But as long as I mark them in some way, then we need to observe what happens. Okay, so we marked P things in here. So what is P? P is this number. And actually, I, I could have picked any string W that has at least that length. And this is going to be my P uh, number. So the P number is the same as the one over here. OK, so P is the number of marked things I have down here. And the length of W is going to be at least that, but it could be way larger. But I have 2 to the k plus 1 marked things at this point. OK, so what I'm going to do is we're, we want to make a path from the top to the bottom so that we repeat a variable. Well, it, it, like the usual pumping lemma. Well, what we want to do is, well, we got to start at the top no matter what we do. But then here, other than that at the very bottom, we have two choices to make of like which side to pick. So this one is going to have some number of marked things under it. We don't know necessarily because the marking is arbitrary. And the same thing for this side. We don't know how many are under it. So we pick the one that maximizes. So whichever one of these has the maximum number of things under it, we're going to pick that one. So maybe it's this side. So we, maybe we'll pick that side. And then maybe it goes right, and then left, right, and, and something like this. Okay. So we're going to pick the maximum number at each place. Okay. So let's see. Well, if we have p things down here that are marked, let's say p, uh, uh, just for simplicity, then that means that uh, the one that we picked that was maximum is at least half. So it could be that the number of marked things on either side is perfectly balanced. That's totally possible. But we always pick the one that's maximum. So we at least do half of whatever the ancestor had. So maybe, just as an example, if this guy had uh, 30 mark things under it, then this thing, the one that we picked, has at least 15 because we picked the maximum of the, the two. And there's nothing in common between the two sides because it's a parse tree. There's no cycles. Okay, So we picked the one that has the, the, the maximum. And as a result of that, well, if we observe what happens down here at the very bottom, 
we have like some variable, let's call it X down here. And it's going to have a single child under it because of this, which leads to some uh, terminal of the string W, let's call it WI. So that means that this thing right here has at most one marked thing, at most. So by our construction right here, we will actually have um, k plus one variables appearing because of this. So k plus one, since we're dividing by two uh, at most every single time, we might do better, but at most we're dividing by two every time. And at the bottom, we're gonna have at most one thing underneath us. That means that there are, there, that means that there are at least k plus one variables along the way. And since k we define to be the number of variables in the grammar, and there are k plus one on the way from the top to the bottom, that means that we must have some variable repeat, which is how the usual pumping lemma goes. So then, so some variable repeats. So let's observe uh, some variables that repeat. So let's say that a is some variable that repeats. There might be other ones, and actually a might occur many times. But let's observe one occurrence of a variable that repeats uh, here. So uh, there's one A and then another A along this path must also appear. So then these two A's must make something of the string. So uh, by this, they actually need to make some non-empty thing, but we're not necessarily concerned with that part. We're concerned with how many uh, mark things that they have. So actually the proof is almost identical to the pumping lemma, but slightly modified for the number of mark things. So the top occurrence is gonna make us uh, slightly more, or maybe way more than the bottom occurrence of A. And so I'm gonna uh, label these sections in terms of these five letters over here. So here's U, V, X, Y, and Z. So we actually immediately get the third one the third condition here, because what I can do is I can just repeat this, um, this, this bigger occurrence of A, the subtree here, where the bottom one is. So I can take this big guy and put it down to the little guy, and then just keep repeating that as many times as we want. And so the proof of that is identical to the pumping lemma for context-free languages, the usual one. So then now we need to justify these two, the things that actually changed. So one thing that you can actually prove based on this idea that we started with at least two to the K plus one, actually exactly, but at least two to the K plus one marked things. And the, uh, the, uh, at the very bottom, we have at most one marked thing. Then what happened, you can actually show, is that for each one of these variables, so let, let's look at a particular occurrence. So like some variable X has two children underneath it. So Y and Z, and we of course will pick the one that has the higher of the two. So one thing that might happen is, let's observe a particular situation here. So it could in principle be that uh, one of these two has no marked descendant underneath them. It can't be that both of them do, uh, because we uh, you can prove that, um, I guess by induction, that uh, if we go from two to the K plus one down to one, and we take the maximum every single time of the two children underneath us, then it can't be that uh, both of these are zero. So there must be one of them that's at least one. But it could be in, uh, very well true that let's say Y has nothing, has no marked terminals underneath it, and then Z has all of them. That's totally possible. So then obviously we're gonna choose the path that goes down uh, on that side. But I wanna convince you that uh, we must have a certain number of what I call our uh, branch points. So a branch point is where both of the children have marked descendants, okay? So the, it's not the situation where we have uh, one having marked things under it and one of them not. That can happen, it's just that uh, we can't have that for too long. We eventually must see a branch point where you could in principle go down both sides. And what's the reasoning behind that? It's actually very simple. So suppose that we didn't have a branch point uh, right here. Then that means that Z has all the marked things underneath it that X does because Y has nothing underneath it. 
then that means that the number of marked things didn't go down. And since it didn't go down, then that's not going to help us get down to 1. So since we need to divide by 2 at most, then that means we need to divide by k plus, uh, divide 2, k plus 1 or more times to get down to 1. That's just not possible if we have a lot of non-branch points like this. We can have them, it's just that we can't have too many. So these a's right here are chosen among the branch points. So the branch points here are, um, are considering that the two children underneath both occurrences of A will have some marked descendants underneath them. In particular, the top one, but it, it, we can select them among the, the, two, uh, the two here. Because if we have K plus one branch points, then we'll have K plus one variables that are branch points. And then now we won't have any issue with what we want to prove at this point. So let's actually prove these two things. So this one's actually a little easier. So suppose that we uh, had this situation that V has nothing and Y has nothing marked. Okay. So let's, let's try to visualize what is occurring there. So we have A up here, and then we have the path going down, A here, going down. There might be some marked things in the X part, but there's nothing over here. Then that means that if we, since A was chosen among the branch points, it is a, a variable that occurs among the branch points, then the right side, let's say that it's C and the left side is B, then that means since, since A was a branch point, then that means that B must have some marked things in re, underneath it. And B's purpose is to see some things in, in the V part right here. So this is VXY. B oversees uh, all of V, or at least some of V, and, and, and so on. And C sees over uh, some things in Y also, because there's no other children underneath this top occurrence of A. So this B must see at least one character of V by uh, Chomsky normal form. And C must see at least one thing of the Y part. So therefore, we will have at least one mark symbol um, under underneath these occurrences of A. All right. So then now, how do we actually prove this? It's also really, really easy. So we can actually choose A to be the lowest repeating variable among all of the branch points. Why can we do that? Well, we... <laughs> If we look at the branch points, eventually there must be one that repeats, but obviously, so we just pick the one that's lowest. Why do we want the one that's lowest? Because among the branch points, that's where if we go upward, the number of marked things underneath it is going to go up. So there's marked things under B and C, and A is going to be the sum of the two. So whenever we go up, whenever we hit a branch point, we're going to increase the number of marked things. So then if we have this right here, we can only have a height of a number of branch points at most k plus 1. And since we set k, 2 to the k plus 1, which is the highest that it could ever be, to be equal to p, the number of marked things underneath it, then therefore the middle three pieces, which under, are under supervision of the top occurrence of a, then that means that the number of marked things underneath it can't exceed this number, which is a P, which is why this is here. All right, so that was the proof of Ogden's lemma, a really, really cool result. And it's not too much harder than the pumping lemma for context-free languages. And it actually lets you prove a whole bunch of other things. So there are some languages that you can prove using this that you can't use in the normal pumping lemma. And there are actually some cool things that you can do, such as proving that uh, language is inherently ambiguous a lot easier. I've done a video on that on the channel before, and it was really complicated. But if you use Ogden's lemma, it's really, really easy. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about Ogden's lemma into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.